All right. Well, we're in Acts chapter 28. I, I wanted to uh, talk about a couple of things um, very quickly uh, that we covered last week. Uh, one is, the, is uh, I don't know if you noticed, uh, but uh, uh, there was a terrorist attack in Paris this week, and uh, several Jewish people that were killed in a, uh, in a kosher uh, uh, supermarket. The, uh, the uh, main synagogue in Paris was closed for the very first time since World War II and the Nazi invasion. That's how long it that, that's happening now. Um, and of course, there's been a lot, a lot in the news. Now, we did mention in, uh, in the message last week the growing anti-Semitism uh, in Europe uh, that comes, well, from a, a, lot, of, uh, <coughs> a lot of areas, but, uh, but as uh, countries like France, Spain, uh, Great Britain, Germany, and others uh, have opened their doors to uh, uh, immigrants coming in from North Africa that are all uh, primarily uh, Muslim, uh, what you have in, in France today is what they call, and maybe you've, now you've heard about it on the news, these idea of these no-go zones where uh, it's, uh, it's run by the Imams. It's right in Paris, but uh, uh, a French policeman cannot even go in there. Uh, uh, the French laws and the Constitution don't even apply. Uh, it's just a whole separate uh, uh, little area. This is the fruit of what's called multiculturalism. Uh, in Hawaii, we have the opposite of that. Everybody blends together. Everybody intermarries. Everybody pretty much figures out how to speak at least pidgin, if not standard English, so we can communicate. Uh, it's uh, we're kind of the opposite of the Tower of Babel. You know, there they uh, their language was confused and they parted. They're all coming back together here in Hawaii as far as one people. You have the opposite of that in Europe, and of course that is part of the growing chorus of how it should be in the United States as well, at least with the uh, uh, academics uh, of our our country. Uh, and the fruit of it then is these, these uh, no-go zones where uh, Islam is able to uh, basically have its own little enclave, uh, and if it becomes and develops uh, terrorist out of that, then so be it, uh, right there uh, in, uh, in France, and, uh, and then the tragic death of uh, those that have died this week. But again, we mentioned that last, last week, we said uh, a record number of French left uh, French Jews left France last year to immigrate to Israel. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was uh, in Paris marching uh, with others today, uh, showing a, a, a unity for other countries like his country, Israel, that suffers at the hands of terrorists on a, on a regular basis, uh, and inviting all, all Jews uh, from France that uh, uh, we would love to have you uh, in Israel. Uh, and uh, anyway, so those are some things we talked about last week. Though. The growing uh, anti-Semitism in Europe, the threat of terrorism as, as a result of that. The other thing we mentioned uh, in terms of the Magog invasion was the idea of the change that had to have happened within Egypt uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood. As long as they were in power, the Magog invasion could not happen uh, because the mother, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, if there's a, a group of Islamic uh, states attacking Israel, <laughs> they'd be all in. So they somehow had to go to set the stage for the Magog invasion. Uh, and of course they have in the, uh, and, uh, the Al, uh, uh, president of the country is Al-Sisi. And uh, I do have a picture of him uh, here uh, for you. And there's a little, just to know a little about, about this guy. This guy was the head of their Supreme Court. And when millions of people uh, marched in the streets to protest uh, the, uh, the terrorism that were going on in the country under the hands of the Muslim Brotherhood, burning uh, churches down, killing Christians, as well as moderate, moderate Muslims. Uh, as the Chief Justice, uh, when the main uh, Coptic church in, uh, in Cairo was burned down, he went down there and told them, we'll find a way to rebuild your church. You know, in other words, this should not be happening uh, in this country. Uh, there's a lot of Christians in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, when he came to power, he did that. He went down there and made sure their church got rebuilt. He attended one of their, he's a Muslim, but he attended one of their Christmas services with them as a show of unity. Um, he's a very, very interesting guy. He made a uh, speech this week that should have been headlines uh, across, the, uh, across the world because uh, he basically, I'll read a few quotes uh, in a moment, uh, because of the uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad's bir birthday, uh, they have basically a, a big get-together at a large university in Cairo, and he there had the opportunity to address all the Islamic scholars and the leading imams of, of Egypt. And what he did is he called them out. And he said, we got problems. It's not because of the West. 
It's not because of the Palestinians. It's not because of Israel. We can't can blame these things. It's not because of poverty. It's our religion. Our religion is the problem. This is what no, no Western commentator or political person uh, has the guts to say. The problem is not multiculturalism. The problem is uh, deep within Islam and what it's, uh, what it's become. Um, let me just read a couple of quotes. He says, and he's, he's looking right at the head of imams when he's saying this. Uh, quote, is it possible that 1.6 billion people, Muslims, should want to kill the rest of the world's inhabitants, that is 7 billion, so that they themselves may live? Impossible. Is, 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 that, is that what we're about? Is that what we're supposed to be doing? Our, our billion, we're supposed to be trying to kill the other 7 billion? Uh, because that's, that's what's happening. Uh, and, he, and he says the problem is Islam. He goes on and says, I'm seeing these words here at Al-Azhar, which is the university there, before this assembly of scholars in Ulima, that's the, the Muslims, uh, that Allah Almighty be witness to your truth on judgment day concerning that which I'm talking about now. At this uh, that I am telling you, you cannot feel uh, it if you remain trapped inside this mindset. You need to step out of yourselves to be able to observe it and reflect on it from a more enlightened perspective. I say and repeat again that we need a religious revolution. You imams are responsible before Allah. The entire world, I say it again, the entire world is waiting for your next move because this ummah, is the, the Muslim people, is being torn apart. It is being destroyed. It is being lost. And it is being lost by our own hands. It's not somebody else's problem. It's not what somebody else is doing to us. It's us and our religion. That's the problem. Gutsy guy. <laughs> Might pray for God's, uh, God's protection. I'm sure he ruffled a, a few feathers. Uh, some historians are comparing that speech to the Martin Luther King Jr. I had a dream speech. I mean, if you want to put that in context in, in, in the Muslim world. Uh, and it, um, uh, it didn't get a lot of press. Um, Fox, uh, Megyn Kelly reported it, talked about it. I think uh, Sean Hannity did the day, the day before. Otherwise, you, just, uh, you can go on YouTube and find it, find it translated and so forth. Very powerful, very, uh, very gutsy, uh, gutsy guy. Uh, but again, in terms of uh, our message last week in the Magog invasion, we were saying that uh, uh, they, yeah, Egypt needs a guy like that in power to actually set the stage for the Magog invasion because Egypt is not involved when these other Muslim nations attack uh, Israel. So very, very interesting. Just kind of wanted to uh, follow up, not the prophet or a son of a prophet, but it's just kind of interesting that when the very things that we study kind of blow up in the, in the headlines, the, uh, uh, the very next week. Well, let's change gear and go to uh, the Apostle Paul. We're in chapter 28. We're going to finish, uh, finish the, the book here. And somebody asked me, it's been a, it's been a brisk 14-month uh, study <laughs> through, through, the, through the book of Acts. <laughs> but I, I always feel bad finishing. It's like, it like reading a great book or a great novel. You almost hate to come to that last, uh, last chapter or whatever. Uh, but here we are at the, uh, at the last chapter. And um, Paul's journey to Rome uh, has been uh, greatly delayed. That's kind of the, the theme that we want to look at. God does allow postponements and delays to come into our lives, and we don't like it. You know, and when you're, you're waiting uh, in an airport, and they, that sign comes up, says your flights uh, have been delayed, none of us are saying, well, hallelujah. You know, it's like we're usually a little upset. We don't even like sitting at stoplights. I, and I have to confess that uh, when I'm driving behind somebody that's going a little less than the speed limit, it's, 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 a, real, it's a real test. <laughs> we don't like... Uh, delays uh, and, and post uh, postponements, uh, but God God uses them. I um, had ordered this uh, little speaker system to uh, to help with a family member who has uh, a little hearing deficiency, and uh, I know that things work work well. And uh, uh, and um, I ordered it. Uh, you know, at Christmas time it came, and then I set it all up, and it, it didn't work. You know. Uh, typical electronics, and it was through Amazon. I contacted them, and I, I sent, you know, make arrangements, uh, get the labels. I, I sent it all back, and now I'm in contact with a, a real person, this guy Ed, and uh, uh, he's, you know, asked me what happened, what went wrong, we're going back and forth, and I get the thing in the mail to him, and uh, it was interesting. It was like, um, I, I had to pay the shipping back, which I wasn't thrilled about, 27 bucks, and, uh, you know, I was really tempted to go, hey, I did nothing wrong. I don't think I should be responsible, you know, my rights, you know, kind of thing, and I just, uh, I'll at least be gracious, and I just wrote back and just said, you know, 
Um, you know, I, I you know I would really appreciate it if you kind of kind of could split the fee here with me a little bit. Help help me out a little bit. You probably don't realize how much it was going to be. You know, being here in Hawaii, but it's almost thirty bucks for me to ship this thing back. He wrote back, super great. Oh, absolutely, no problem, and I completely understand. And so so we're emailing back and forth a little bit, and he gets it and he tests it and all this stuff. Anyways, getting ready to ship a new one back to me, and let me know that uh, it'll be on his way. But he can't get to the post office uh, till Monday because he's got some more tests to go undergo because he's got cancer. It's like, well, that's an open door. <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden it's like, all these, what, what is all the delay and this thing not working all, all about? Maybe it's just about this one guy. How, how often do you correspond with a sales guy and he tells you he's got cancer? That just doesn't happen every day. I immediately wrote back, hey, I'm so sorry to hear that, Ed. And I just want you to know, I'll be praying for you, and, you know, for God to heal you. And, you know, and I'll be thinking about you and so forth. Not your typical response from a, uh, a disgruntled customer either, probably. But uh, delays, you know, they, they bum us out. But uh, uh, God's got wonderful intentions. So often, uh, if we can follow the example uh, of the Apostle Paul here. Let's read the first 16 verses of the chapter. And it's certainly uh, uh, appropriate to entitle it. Paul's arrival in Rome is postponed. He's uh, two years in Caesarea. Uh, in prison there. Now he finally gets on a ship. The ship is wrecked. Uh, uh, they all make it ashore. Uh, they're in Malta. We mentioned the fact that they, the text says they grabbed boards and went through the surf. We just don't know if they stood up, but we do know the Apostle Paul did surf on this occasion. Now when they had escaped uh, from the ocean, uh, they, they then found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. That means it, it, it's biting him. So when the other natives uh, saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he escaped from the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire, suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. <laughs> in that region, there was a, in a state of the leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius, uh, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery, Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers, which had wintered at the island. In landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, we circled around and reached uh, Regium. Uh, after one day, the south wind blew, and the next day we came to Butioli, well, where we found brethren uh, and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went up towards Rome. Uh, and from there, uh, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as the Appia or Appius Forum uh, in three inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Now when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with soldiers uh, who guarded him. So he finally makes it to Rome, but certainly there's a, a delay or a postponement uh, in our, our title is, uh, did uh, Paul's journey end on schedule? I, I think we hopefully at the end would uh, agree uh, that that was uh, true. Uh, but notice that uh, being postponed didn't stop Paul from being used by God. I mean, obviously he's praying for people, he's healing people, all these things are going on. It uh, didn't ruffle his, uh, his feathers. Keep in mind also uh, that he uh, does first, uh, he begins to serve others. And we're saying that he did that because it was a pattern of his life. Paul basically was calling the shots. He was the guy standing on the deck of the ship in the storm saying, my God has shown me this and you're going to be saved. You do what I tell you to do. And now Julius, the centurion, is basically taking orders from the apostle Paul. The guys are trying to jump over the ship. Paul says, uh, don't let those guys get away or none of us will live. Hey, you guys get back over here. It's, uh, you know, the, everything has changed. And, uh, and so now they're on shore. Uh, what Paul said would happen did happen. It would have been fine for Paul to take a break. 
<laughs> Let the other guys get the wood, you know, and so forth. But he doesn't. Um, I, I don't think in Paul's mind he thought that, uh, well, we're on shore now. It would be good if I led by example and showed everybody what a great servant of Jesus Christ I I don't think he even thought about it. I just thought, they need a fire? Let's get wood. You know, and he just got up and, uh, and began to do it because it was a pattern of his life. If God is going to use us in a delay, in a postponement, um, it often begins with our whole attitude and have this, has this been kind of woven into the fabric of our life, this idea that, as Jesus said, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must become the servant of all. Uh, and certainly the Apostle Paul had. I want to read a couple of verses from John's Gospel, and it's the episode where Jesus washes the feet of, of the disciples. He takes the place of the lowest of the lowest servant in the home, uh, in that culture, in order to do this. And he does it for a point. And that's in John 13, too. Uh, here it says, after supper uh, being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, <laughs> To betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. Uh, Jesus serves them in a very humble way. Uh, and I think one of the things that helps him do it is knowing that the Father had given him all things, knowing that he had come from God and was going to God. Uh, if we know who we are in Jesus Christ, what God has done for us, uh, where we've come from, what our lives were like before, what they are like now, uh, there were, where we're going, God is working and changing us. He's doing a work in us. And one day, uh, we're going to be with him for all eternity. It then kind of makes it a lot easier to serve people. It's not always to serve people. And sometimes, you, even when you begin, people realize that, uh, hey, this is somebody I can manipulate. Nobody ever manipulated Jesus. It's possible to be the servant of all and never be uh, manipulated by others. Let me give you an example. When you're, when you're the, the new person on, on the job, if you're smart, <laughs> you'll try to work really hard <laughs> those first couple of weeks because you're, you're kind of trying to prove yourself. You want everybody to know that, hey, I'm, I'm a good worker and I, I know what I'm doing. And it was, you did a good thing in hiring me. You just kind of make that little extra effort because you're the new guy. Uh, and, that's a good, and that's a good thing. What are you doing? You're trying to, you're trying to prove, prove yourself. Uh, but at the same time, people live that way. They're constantly trying to prove themselves. They're, they're the kind of the braggarts, or I've always done it better, and uh, they always speak very uh, highly of themselves. Sometimes we say they're a legend in their own mind. You know? And uh, uh, those kind of people are not going to be comfortable or ever think about the idea of serving others. It's not going to come to their mind or their imagination naturally or normally. It's the person that, you know, feels pretty good about who they are and what they're all about. And they really don't have to prove anything to anyone. They're just, they're okay. They can just serve others. Well, what will people think? I don't really care. <laughs> you can just, uh, there's a freedom that, that Christ can bring us. If we know whose we are, where we've come from, where we're going. And I think we certainly see that uh, uh, in Paul's life. It certainly was exhibited uh, uh, in the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, and um, I just, uh, you know, appreciate, you know, the uh, examples that, uh, uh, that were given in the context of, of church, you know, in terms of uh, pastors that are servants. And certainly uh, Pastor Chuck, uh, you know, comes to mind. I mean, uh, amazing. I, you know, I, I just, you know, here's a guy that uh, is in church history books, you know, and, uh, you know, we'll... Uh, be in heaven one day and probably you know, really fathom all that uh, God did through the life of uh, Pastor Chuck Smith uh, in terms of founding the Calvary Chapels and just influencing uh, the way we worship today uh, and just uh, the way we teach the Bible and so many other things. But uh, I remember being at a conference five, six years ago in Marietta for all the senior pastors. We're at the conference grounds. We're coming out of the dining room. I, uh, I happened to uh, slip in a, li the, a little bathroom that's right off the, uh, the dining room right there. And, and I go in. It's kind of small. It's kind of tight. And, and here's Chuck. Chuck's got paper towels. And he's, he's wiping down all the countertops because guys have been in there washing their hands. And as they do, splattering uh, water all, all around. Uh, but Chuck's uh, not calling for somebody to uh, take care of the bathroom. He's just cleaning it. Uh, it's because that's what he did. That's what he did all, all the time, you know, his entire life. Uh, if we're 
uh, aware and uh, in our lives, there becomes a pattern of being aware of other people, of serving other people. Then when the delays and the postponements come, uh, God can use us. Uh, I, again, I don't think it's one of those things where uh, when the ship's going down, you, learn, you start taking swimming lessons. I think that's too late already. Uh, but if it's in the fabric uh, of who we are, uh, we recognize, hey, as a Christian, Jesus served others. He called me to serve others. He says, this is what the kingdom of God is all about. And just kind of learn to do that and learn to be that, what we say, others-oriented kind of a person. Uh, then when the trying times come, uh, God can, uh, can use our lives. Uh, it's certainly true of, uh, of the Apostle Paul uh, and great leaders, but it's true of uh, all of our lives. Secondly, Paul experienced the power of God as a result of, of uh, uh, while in serving others, uh, as this viper uh, fastens on his hand. Now, this is kind of interesting. <laughs> Uh, the people that lived on the island there, uh, they, uh, again, they were, you know, worshiped the Greek gods uh, and so forth. Uh, and so uh, what they're saying here, very interesting, is that, uh, you know, here's a guy that escaped uh, the shipwreck. He gets on shore and a, and a deadly snake bites him. They're, they're waiting for him to swell up and die on the ground, right, right within minutes, right? And, uh, and nothing, nothing happens. Uh, and they use the phrase, the idea that, well, this is justice. And uh, actually in our uh, Bibles, the NIV gets it right. That should be capitalized. That's the name of one of their gods. Uh, the daughter of, of Zeus is justice. Justice is getting him. In other words, he's getting what, uh, what he deserves. Uh, and, uh, and yet, when uh, it doesn't happen, obviously God miraculously intervenes uh, and prevents Paul from, from dying from this poisonous snake. So now they think he's a god. <laughs> it's like, well, our god should have destroyed him, justice, but he didn't, so he must be a god himself. Uh, not the first time Paul's uh, had that said to him. Uh, we saw that happen back in, in uh, Lystra as, as well, when he was able to do something uh, miraculous. Uh, but uh, the power of God certainly was in, uh, in his life, uh, even at the time of, of delay or postponement. And third, uh, we see that Paul believed in prayer. That's in verse 7. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was uh, Publius. So, Luke describes the condition of his father. Uh, Paul goes in, prays. Uh, very important, he prays. And he's kind of like, what would God have me to do? He prays, and then uh, he lays hands on him and prays for him, uh, and the man uh, is healed. Now, um, Luke doesn't mention uh, Paul preaching the gospel on the island, but uh, I, I, uh, I think uh, uh, just because of who Paul is, we can take that for granted, uh, and certainly uh, we'll give you... Uh, a little bit of uh, history behind that to let you know that he did. So three months, uh, uh, verse 11, before we put out the sea, that would have been no mid-November to mid-February. Uh, we don't know if all 276 guys that came ashore get on this next ship, but they find another ship that's been wintering there, another Alexandrian ship uh, that's ready to uh, put the sea, and uh, they are granted passage on it. And um, I, I just think it's interesting, uh, verse 11, Luke, uh, again, all the, the details, the uh, that he gives in terms of uh, the sea and navigation and so forth. Uh, and here he mentions the twin, uh, the twin brothers, uh, which is uh, Castor and Pollux. So these are, again, uh, demagogues, of, you know, the Greek pantheon. Uh, and these guys were supposed to give you safety at sea. Uh, and I appreciate this little line. It's like, well, what, 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 what's in there for? You know, it's like, I think there's a little sarcasm here. I always preach sarcasm anytime I can find it in the Bible because I'm kind of given it that way. But uh, uh, remember what kind of ship they were shipwrecked on? An Alexandrian ship. Guess what was probably on the front of that? The twin brothers. Didn't really help, did it? <laughs> so Luke just kind of mentioned, yeah, there are those guys again. Didn't help last time. We won't be trusting in them. But uh, they would go on and sail from Malta 80 miles to Syracuse, uh, another 70 to uh, Regium, uh, and then 180 to uh, Puteoli. And I... Uh, Probably uh, blue blind those those slides uh, that uh, were uh, had a picture of uh, uh, of the island of Malta and uh, is it possible to go back to this? okay there it is yeah kind of beautiful Mediterranean and uh, uh, and then the next slide is actually uh, what's called uh, Saint Paul's Bay so that's a traditional site uh, known for Paul surfing no known for the shipwreck and uh, and where they uh, went in. And then there was uh, one more that was a map that was maybe before those two, just to kind of give you a, a sense 
I will get my little laser pointer out, but you know, again, they leave to the right is uh, Israel. Uh, they sail across all the way to the middle there, which is, um, uh, uh, you, you see the uh, Fair Havens, the port that they stayed in. You can't see it, only I can. Uh, very small print. Uh, uh, and you can see the wobbly line indicating this is when they were being blown in the storm in the far left. The little dot there is uh, Malta, and they're headed straight north. So they Syracuse, Regium, and then Futioli is uh, present-day Naples, the main port for, uh, for Rome, uh, and they're going to go over foot uh, from there. Uh, this post postponement, though, uh, did not keep Paul from encouraging others or being encouraged himself. Look at verse 14. Uh, when we found brethren, we were invited to stay with them seven days, and so we went to, to Rome. So Paul uh, comes ashore, and the first thing he does, they come to a little town, a little village. He's like, man, is there any believers here? Uh, anybody we can encourage? You know, anybody we can uh, minister, minister to? And, and they find some. Uh, and again, that's uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, I was reading the proverb for, for today, and uh, it says something about, uh, uh, and with the water that you water, you will be watered. That, that means, you know, it's, it's, uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you're out there, you know, encouraging other people, you'll probably be encouraged your, yourself. Uh, and sometimes we, uh, we need a little encouragement, but uh, it was just part of who the Apostle Paul was. Hey, let's see if we can find some uh, believers while we're here. This also speaks to this issue of Julius. Obviously, the centurion, Julius, has to go along with all this. Uh, but you have to be uh, three months with the Apostle Paul, with him night and day. That their relationship had to have uh, dramatically changed from the time they first met, uh, from Julius now uh, listening to the Apostle Paul. Uh, you know, Paul, you know, giving the instructions that saves all of their lives. Uh, the man now owes his life uh, to the Apostle Paul. Uh, they show up. He sees Paul get by, bit by the snake and nothing happens. He sees Paul go into the guy's home. Publius and uh, pray his father is the heal. He sees all the other people lined up and he sees them all get healed. I'm just betting that guy might have got saved somewhere along the way. Either that or he, he likes Paul a lot because uh, when they arrive, it's like, can we uh, visit some other Christians? Yeah, absolutely, no problem. And when Paul gets to Rome, it says they, they we'll get to that, but they turned over the other prisoners. But, but, <laughs> term of contrast, but Paul stayed at his own rent at home. How did that come about? Could be Julius. I mean, some, somebody's putting a good word in for him somewhere. Uh, but obviously, their, their relationship has changed dramatically. Verse 15 is where Paul gets encouraged himself. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as the uh, Appia uh, Forum and the three inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. These guys had uh, hoofed it 40 miles. And uh, apparently Paul had texted them several days ahead to let them know that, uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know how they knew, but they, word had gotten there uh, that Paul was coming or had made sure. Uh, they come down 40 miles to, uh, to meet him. Uh, and, uh, and obviously he's uh, uh, very, very encouraged uh, by that uh, and uh, uh, by these believers that he's never met, but remember he's written to them. Uh, three years earlier, Paul writes to the church at Rome. These, these are the believers. Uh, and he starts out in chapter 1. You remember talking about how he, man, he just can't wait to see them. And he just longs uh, to, to see them. And he's tried to get there on several occasions. Pray that I'll get there because when I get there, I think it'll be, my, my paraphrase, an awesome time because I think we'll both be blessed. The term he uses are mutual edification. In other words, the apostle Paul was in Satan. And as the apostle, I'm sure I'll be a great blessing to you when I arrive. No, he's saying, you know, when I get there, I hope I can minister to you guys, but I know I'm going to be blessed. I know I'm going to be built up in my faith just from being, being with you guys. This is the apostle, the apostle Paul. And, um, and now these guys, having received that letter, and man, what a treasure it is to us today. You can imagine them, uh, and they've, uh, they've hoofed it 40 miles down there to, uh, to meet him. Uh, it uh, has Paul then, therefore, following the biblical timeline, he's arriving in Rome in the spring of 61 AD. I mention that because the uh, Roman historian Tacitus says the exact same thing. I love it when, when you can find some written history outside the Bible, put them together and find that they, uh, they match exactly. Of course, the term he uses in the seventh year of the reign of uh, Caesar Nero. And uh, he's going to be on the throne for a few more years. One writer said when Paul finally left Malta, 
he felt more like an honored dignitary than a prisoner of Rome, and in God's sight, uh, he was. So the last part of the journey is by land. That's another 125 miles and uh, 43 miles uh, uh, you know, to uh, Appius and then uh, 33 miles from uh, the three taverns. So uh, Paul's arrival was postponed, and, um, and, and yet we would say that um, uh, I, I certainly like it makes a case to say that he arrived right on time. There was really no postponement at all. How do we know that? We know that because of from church history, every person on the island of Malta came to faith in Christ. And Publius became their pastor. Later, then, he is asked to take over the church in Athens. A tremendous challenge in that intellectual center, but a, a well-established church there where he serves for many years before he's martyred for his faith in Jesus Christ. There was a tremendous fruit from this postponement uh, and this delay. Uh, and there can be in our lives as well. If, if, if their pattern of our life is just kind of to serve others, we'll think about that. We'll start looking around uh, in, those, in those times. If we really understand the power of God and the importance of prayer, uh, our, our schedule may be delayed, but uh, it doesn't mean that God can't uh, use us. Uh, secondly, we go to Paul's preaching from prison. Uh, and it was certainly fruitful. I think you'll agree as we uh, take a look at a couple of the details of it. Verse 17 to 31. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go, because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I called for you to see you and speak with you. Uh, because for the hope of Israel, I'm bound with this chain. Then they said to him, we neither receive letters from Judea concerning you, nor have we any of the brethren who have came, who have came, reported or spoken any evil of you. But we desire to hear from you what you think for concerning this sect, which we know it is spoken against everywhere. It's a reference to the Christians. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets, from morning till evening. That's a long Bible study. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So let's go back. Paul's preaching from prison is fruitful, uh, and it certainly begins with the, the leaders. He's only there three days, and he has to see the leaders of, of the Jewish com community. How many of that would have been? It would have been a lot. There were thousands of Jews that, uh, that lived in Rome at the time. Uh, the uh, Tiber River uh, passed through uh, Rome, uh, and uh, on one side was the imperial uh, city. That's not where the Wizard of Oz lives, though. That's just where the... Uh, anyway, they lived on the other side uh, of the river and uh, uh, had a, a huge community there. So when he asked to see the leaders, there would have been quite a few. Uh, one writer even said they, he thinks they set it up like the Sanhedrin. There might have been 120 of them, but that seems like a stretch or, or a lot. But either way, it's, it's quite a few guys. He's there three days and he wants to see them. And what he does is he begins to review uh, the events that took place uh, in Jerusalem that led to his arrest. And basically, he insists on three things. One, he's done nothing against the Jewish people. 
to after uh, his arrest, he's found not guilty. And it's only the Sanhedrin, the Jew Jewish leaders, uh, that, uh, that wanted him to uh, be in prison and so forth. Uh, and he wants to clarify, three, that he's a loyal Jew. And the only reason he's in change today is because of the hope that he has uh, in, uh, in the nation of Israel in terms of the Messiah, uh, Jesus Christ. Now, their response is, uh, is interesting. There's a little history behind it. Verse 22 uh, they say, but we desire to hear from you what you think uh, for concerning the sect. Now, the word sect is not the, the word that would, they would normally use. And like, you know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, those are sects of Judaism. The word that's translated sect here means uh, sect is a cult. Uh, we'd like to hear more about this cult from you. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that it's spoken against everywhere. Uh, and again, this is the belief that Jesus is is the Messiah, and uh, so we want to hear more, uh, more about it. They act like they don't know much, they know a great deal. They're lying through their teeth. Uh, and the reason we know that uh, is from history itself, uh, and because of a, a couple that we've met earlier in the book of Acts. Under Claudius, under Nero Claudius, uh, at one point in time, the disputing and sometimes writing among the Jews in that big Jewish community uh, over the ones that believed in in, uh, in Christo, in the Messiah, in Jesus of Nazareth, disputing uh, with the others, it got so bad, he kicked all the Jews out of Rome. He drove them all out. If you're Jewish, you got to get out of Rome. I'm tired of hearing this. So, so for these guys to say that, yeah, we don't know a lot about this, you know, so we'd love to hear what you have to say about it. It's kind of tongue-in-cheek. Now, again, the couple that were driven out that we met earlier will, was uh, Aquila and Priscilla who Paul runs into in Corinth, uh, ends up, they're all tent makers, they work together, live together, Paul disciples them for a period of time, but they're there because Emperor Claudius kicked them out of Rome over the dispute about Jesus the Messiah. Uh, they return uh, to Rome uh, because uh, when Paul, three years earlier, writes the letter to the Romans, at the end, you can read the ending, and he'll say, please greet Aquila and Priscilla who have a church in their home. So they're back in Rome. They're, they're there. You know, they know Paul's coming. They've already, already got other home fellowship uh, going uh, uh, in, in that city. Uh, but uh, again, these guys are uh, kind of since lying, lying through their teeth when they say they don't really know anything about the, this sect. There's a uh, theological term for that. We call it baloney. And uh, <laughs> so Paul's going to, he's going to have all these guys in anyway. Uh, and uh, despite what they've uh, said or referred to, uh, he gets the big audience. So he goes from the leaders to, uh, we're saying, a large gathering of Jews. Verse 23, and notice he explained and solemnly testified to the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets, morning till evening. And uh, we could kind of break this down and say that uh, he explains to them the character and the coming of the kingdom. I'm sure Paul was ch chopping at the bit. Uh, to get to do this, have a bunch of guys show up uh, that's got this Jewish background so he can appeal to the prophets. He can appeal to uh, everything in what we call the Bible and the Old Testament to show them that uh, Jesus is the Messiah. And he talks about the character of the coming kingdom. They all believe there's a coming kingdom. Uh, you know, believing Jews today believe there's a coming kingdom. I believe the Messiah is going to come back. He's going to establish his rule. He's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. All the promises made to David are still going to come true. As we, we believe that as well. We call that the millennial kingdom of Christ. What they didn't believe or didn't see was that the Messiah would come twice. He would come first and he'd be the suffering servant to die for the sins of the world. And then he would come again a second time to establish his kingdom. So Paul's trying to make a case and help them understand there's two comings and you've missed that, that, first, uh, uh, that first coming. Uh, the word translated explains means to set out or to place before. And I'm, Paul, I'm sure Paul was very logical and very reasonable in, uh, in all of his arguments to kind of make a case uh, for the two comings and the kingdom of God that is yet future. Uh, secondly, he tried to convince them that through the scriptures that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. So again, he could have gone to Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and all the passages that we're familiar with to prove that Jesus in fact uh, uh, was born in Bethlehem. He was called a Nazarene. He, he lived the life that the scripture said that, uh, that he would live. He, he died a perfect sinless life. He came into Jerusalem on the exact day that Daniel said that he would come in. Uh, he died on a cross. His clothes were gambled for. He was uh, died between two thieves. I mean, he could just see all the, 
all the uh, passages we're familiar with, Paul would have been able to brilliantly uh, lay them out. And, verse 24, some were convinced. Some became believers. It's like, wow, okay. I didn't, didn't really see that before. <laughs> so they, uh, they understand who Jesus is. But a big dispute uh, breaks out. So he concludes uh, with quoting Isaiah 6, uh, 9 and 10. The most frequently Old Testament scripture quoted in the New Testament six times. Uh, Jesus uses it in Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. Uh, and uh, the disciples come and ask Jesus why he taught in parables. And he quotes this passage uh, in, in uh, Matthew 13, 11. The Apostle John in his gospel applied it to Israel in John chapter 12. And uh, Paul quotes it uh, when he wrote to this church uh, here in Rome in chapter 11. Now you can imagine Isaiah, you know, awesome ministry. Well, Isaiah, I, want you, I got a message for you to deliver to the people. Did I mention they're not going to listen? Yeah, they're not going to listen. They won't understand. And they'll be able to care, care less. But despite that, here's the message I want you to deliver. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You know, sometimes God asks us to do something not because it's going to produce great results, but just because he said so. <laughs> and uh, and as I, Isaiah does that. And he's, he's talking to the people in context prior to the Babylon captivity. You better get your act together and turn back to God or some very bad things are uh, coming up here in your future. Although, even as I say this, you know, you're not really listening. You're not really perceiving. You know, you're kind of giving me lip service and you're kind of listening. But I guess is uh, nothing's really happening. Uh, and the nation gets, uh, gets judged. Jesus comes along and applies that to a generation of Jews and Jewish leaderships that have rejected the gospel uh, and his messiahship. Uh, Paul applies it here again to this crowd of Jews that are disputing over who Jesus is. Is he saying that, uh, uh, that uh, no Jews can get saved? No, they're, they're all Jewish. Paul as well. And some are saved. What he's saying is that as a nation, as a nation, the nation is not going to get saved at this time, and the kingdom is not going to be established at this time because they've rejected the Messiah. Will individual Jews continue to get saved? Absolutely. Uh, he says, and not only that, also, also, the gospel is now going to go to Gentiles, which uh, uh, probably would have uh, irked uh, a few people in that room. Uh, but Paul makes his case here. Uh, to present the gospel. He doesn't see himself in our bigger uh, picture of being limited simply because he was in a prison cell. He could still have a, uh, an awesome uh, ministry, which, which he does. Uh, and that takes us to uh, our third point, uh, this idea of not limiting the gospel. Verse 30, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who uh, came to him. There's some, uh, as I just mentioned, great application here for us. Uh, one writer said, Paul's room became a fulcrum from which he moved the world. Uh, I mean, you know, you get, the, get the, the lever and the fulcrum, and then you can pick up something pretty heavy. But from Paul's little, little rented house, he moved the entire, the entire world. He wasn't limited just to those that came to see him. The other believers that were there, other people that had questions, not limited to that at all. Uh, and we see that as he writes... Uh, he writes the church in Philippi at this time. At this time, he writes them, and he says this in chapter 1, verse 12. I want you to know, brethren, uh, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it's become uh, evident to the whole palace guard uh, and to all the rest that my, uh, that my change are in Christ. Paul's uh, got a captive audience. He's got a Roman soldier that's chained to him, uh, and, they, and, uh, and they are rotated out every, every four hours. Uh, and he's saying, writing back to the church in Philippi, hey, pretty awesome uh, what's, uh, how it's turned out here. I mean, I was delayed getting here, and I'm confined to this one room, but uh, God is actually using it for the furtherance of the gospel. In another part, uh, verse in Philippians, he says, you know, and some of the other brothers, they, they've, they're even more bold and confident because of my imprisonment and my chains. And that, that's... Uh, that's awesome. And then these, uh, these Roman guards. And again, these are, this is the imperial court. Uh, these are, these are, like, are kind of like Delta Force, Navy SEAL kind of guys. These are elite guys that would uh, be serving there uh, right in, in Rome and so forth. And they're, uh, you can imagine being chained to Paul. And they, did I tell you they can't talk? They can't say a word. They're going to say, uh, I sure appreciate it if you'd shut up. They, they can't say a word to him. All they can do is sit there. And, uh, and we know some of the things that Paul probably said to him from because uh, he writes Ephesians during this time, Ephesians 6. And he makes a reference to the guy's outfit. Wow, that's an awesome helmet, man. 
it. I love the, the red, the red at the top. Reminds me of the blood of Christ. That's like a helmet of salvation right there. Let me tell you about the helmet of salvation. You can imagine for four hours, you know, the next day. We covered the helmet yesterday. Awesome breastplate. That's righteousness. That's what you have in you. You know, you can imagine these, these guys. Uh, and and uh, uh, he, he says uh, a lot of them have come to faith in Christ. Uh, and uh, I found this thing this week I read, I thought it was very interesting, uh, that verifies that, that very fact from a uh, historical source. Uh, in Rome today, a scratched, uh, there's a square of plaster cut from the wall of the barracks uh, of the palace guard during this time of Caesar Nero. On it is scratched a human figure with a donkey's head. The figure is nailed to a cross uh, and a man is pictured kneeling before it. So there, this is a mockery of who Jesus is. Donkey's head nailed to a cross, guy kneeling before it. And the inscription reads, uh, uh, Anna ex minos, which means worships his God. So they're, 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 they're in the barracks and they put this thing on the wall saying, hey, you Christians, you're, you're idiots. You're worshiping a guy that's nothing but a donkey. You worship your God. A lot of sarcasm going on here. Uh, a lot of disputing within the barracks. Not easy to be a Christian and be in the military, is it? It wasn't in the first century either, by the way. But these guys are coming to faith in Christ uh, and, uh, and living for the Lord. And evidently, they're able to have influence on others. Because secondly, we'd say that Paul was not limited to visitors and guards because in that same letter uh, to the church at Philippi, in chapter 4, verse 21, at the end, he says, uh, Greet every saint in Jesus Christ, the brethren who uh, with me greet you, all the saints greet you, but especially those of Caesar's household. Now, we've mentioned this before, that Caesar Nero's wife comes to faith in Christ. Her mother comes to faith in Christ. Other members of the household come to faith in Christ. Nero finds out and kills every one of them. They're all martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. How did they hear the gospel? I don't think they're visiting Paul. Oh, they got the same Roman guards. Very interesting. I mean, we, we, you know, we'll find out when we get to heaven, but somehow these Gentiles living in the palace uh, have heard the gospel. It's the same guards uh, that's uh, over Paul that circulate through that, that same palace. Uh, Paul's uh, uh, ministry wasn't, wasn't real limited, was it? Uh, we'd also say it wasn't limited to visitors, guards, or even Caesar's household, uh, because during this two years, he writes Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. Uh, tremendous encouragement, uh, these letters to these churches, as, as they are uh, for us today and have been for, uh, for 2,000 years. And reading the letter, uh, you know, chapter 1 of Philippians, uh, uh, he says, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I desire, desire to part and be with Christ, which is better by far. In other words, it's okay if they take my head right now, I'll just be in heaven. You know, he says, but, but, you know, I, I have this sense that I'm going to, remain here, that it might be more fruitful labor, you know, for me and for you. So he's, he's an expressing, you know, yeah, I'm here for a while, but I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm out of here at some point in time. Uh, and that, that is exactly, of course, what, uh, what did happen. Uh, during this time, he's got Timothy with him. Uh, John Mark is with him. Luke is with him. Aristarchus is with him. Epaphras is with him. Justice is with him. Uh, and Philemon. Uh, and then, uh, or Demas, excuse me. And then he writes to Philemon because he's led uh, Onesimus, who is one of his runaway slaves, he's led, uh, led him to the Lord. Uh, Paphroditus is the guy that uh, uh, comes from Philippi with an offering to give to the Apostle Paul. Almost died getting there, uh, but he gets there and gives uh, an offering to, to help Paul uh, in his ready <coughs> home during this time of his imprisonment. Tychicus is Paul's mailman who delivers Ephesians, Colossians, and uh, and Philemon. Uh, you can understand that line about Paul, God used Paul's cell, cell, his rented home, his imprisonment as a fulcrum to move the world. Uh, sometimes we, uh, we think God can't use us or can't use us a lot because of some kind of limitations. My personality, I'm, I'm shy, I don't think I can do what other people do, I don't have that same kind of testimony, I don't know enough of the Bible, uh, you know, I'm older, I can't get around, you know, we've all, we've all got the, the limitations. Uh, but I think that's a mistake uh, to, to see ourselves in, in, uh, in that way. Uh, and I wanted to uh, uh, close uh, with, uh, with somebody that could have, uh, a quote from somebody that certainly could have taken that, that, that position. That's uh, 
uh, Joni Erickson Tata. 1967, she di dives into the Chesapeake Bay uh, and, uh, and is paralyzed, never feels her, her body again. This is somebody that could say, I think I'm very limited in how God could use my life. I can't even move. That's, that's pretty limiting. Uh, she mentioned uh, in um, Philip Yancey's book, quoting from her, uh, the idea that uh, few of us have the luxury, it took me forever to think of it as that, to come to ground zero with, with God. She says, you know, before my accident, I was a Christian, and I thought, I thought about how God could fit into my plans, you know. Uh, how will God fit into my life situations? How will he affect my dating life? How will he affect my career plans? How will he affect the things that I enjoy? And she says, all that was gone. It was just me. I, was help I was, had a helpless body. It was just me and God. And then she said, quote, I had no other identity but God. And gradually he became enough. I became overwhelmed with the phenomena of the personal God who created the universe living in my life. He would make me attractive and worthwhile. Maybe God's gift to me is my dependence on him. I will never reach the place where I'm self-sufficient, uh, where God is crowded out of my life. I'm aware of his grace to me every moment. I need help. My need for help is so obvious every day when I wake up flat on my back, waiting for someone to come and dress me. I cannot even comb my hair or blow my nose alone. And one more thing, I have hope for the future. The Bible speaks of our bodies being glorified in heaven. In high school, that was a, a hazy foreign concept. But now I realize that I'll be healed. Uh, I have not been cheated out of being a complete person. Uh, I am just going through a, a 40 year delay and God is with me even through that. Being glorified, I know the meaning of that now. It's the time after my death and when I'll be on my feet and I'll be dancing. That's glorification to somebody that's been paralyzed their whole life. But if you know anything about her life, she's had a huge uh, impact through her writing, her speaking, her artwork, uh, just a phenomenal person that never saw the limitations of, by the way, needing a body uh, to be able to, uh, to serve the Lord. Paul never saw the limitations either. He was okay uh, being in that prison cell, in that, uh, that rented house, and faithfully serve God and continue to serve him. Uh, he's there for a, a period of time. Uh, he's released. Uh, church history tells us he does make it to Spain. Uh, where it was, he was longing to get, that was the end of the earth for him, and he wanted to get there with the gospel. It's not that he liked uh, Spanish food, but uh, he's just, he wanted to get there with the gospel. That was kind of the end of the world, the Roman world uh, for him. He's rearrested by Nero in 67 AD and beheaded outside of, uh, of Rome. Uh, that time, uh, chained uh, in the Mamertine prison cell of Rome today, treated like a, a common criminal, writing Second Timothy and asking him to try to, try to get there before it's... Uh, Winter, bring, bring his parchments and uh, the cloak that I left. But uh, uh, an amazing life and somebody that we want to emulate and follow. Uh, delays, postponements, uh, absolutely. We get them all the time. The question is, how do we react to them? Uh, if we see ourselves as believers in Jesus Christ who, like Jesus, learn to serve other people, to have our eyes out for the needs of other people, then naturally, normally, like Paul, We'll end up doing that. Um, we'll end up experiencing God's power in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, we will end up uh, being able to pray possibly for other people like Paul did and see, and see God move. But if it's just a bummer <laughs> and my plans are ruined, uh, then there's just a lot we're going to miss out on. Uh, don't limit God and uh, don't limit the, the delays. Amen.
Thank you.